Greetings. <laughs> Hiya, Mark. What's that in the background? You've got a lot of records there on the wall. Uh, they're uh, clients of mine. Oh, sweet. Very good. Let me just turn that on to airplane mode. Um, welcome. And uh, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. It's, uh, I was uh, really pleased to hear from you. I just did one earlier, actually, with Filmo Farage, and uh, that went well. So uh, I happen to have two on the same day. That's great. Uh, and is primarily this is for other voice teachers or for singers or what's the what's the philosophy behind it? It's kind of a bit of both. Um, I want to get. I really want to get coaches talking more to just just because um, when I think about when I came up and seeing different methods and different ideas and stuff I think um, sometimes there's this sense of you know of um, you know how do these different ideas cross over and uh, and what are the common ground coaches have things like this and I uh, I was talking to Phil earlier actually about how a lot of the time, you know, it's a coach will explain something in a certain way and another coach in another way. And often when you actually get down to the details, they're kind of just explaining the same thing in a slightly different way. But based Absolutely. on the, yeah, based on the interpretation, sometimes people can, you know, take things very differently and um, things like that. So I, I just want to kind of, A, interact with other coaches myself and also B, kind of, information for singers and information for maybe you know more I guess coaches or people that are really interested in this kind of thing um, Great. yeah so that was that that was that really um and uh, I often think of additional or diet plans there it all comes down to probably an essential core of, of sameness but there's all these branches of ideologies and approaches and belief systems, and I think that's where uh, a layperson would get really confused. I'm I'm always apologizing for the the wealth of information out there, but the, the, it seems so conflicting at first when you're when you're first trying to make sense of it. Certainly, Certainly. and I think as and you I get think... better, you start to understand the similarities more. But when you start exactly. out, it feels like everything's very very different. Um, and uh, I think that's partly a failing on, you know, on the, on our part in the sense of, um, it would be nice if we can communicate some of this information better to people. But it's a challenge because it's a bit, you know, it's like the wild west out there, really. You know, there's mm -hmm. no kind of, there's no uh, council of voice coaches, so to speak, where we kind of agree on some of these things. And obviously, there's a lot of history with the classical tradition, and now the more modern type of singing we have and modern coaches um, and all that stuff so it's a little bit of a, a, a quagmire I guess for uh, people coming into it um, that, that's, uh, that kind of leads us into a nice starting point really in terms of uh, asking you about your starting point as a singer I just I, I noticed you've got voicelesson.com as your domain so I'm assuming mm -hmm. you must have you must have been doing this online for quite a amount of time to to get a domain like that I'm, I'm assuming when you when you found that domain there was probably not many singing teachers on the internet but I, I mean wrong in that I'm just kind of guessing I was thinking like that that's the type of domain that must had to have been snapped up a long time ago it's a funny story because it's I I go way beyond before the internet of course I've been teaching for about 34 years now and had a singing career before that and so I was a neighbor of mine that said you know, I had already been teaching for quite a while, and he said, "You got to get a website." And I was like, "What good is a website?" And I was really against the whole idea because I I hadn't advertised up to that point, uh, didn't see I, I didn't I didn't see a value in it. And so when uh, he kept nagging me, kept nagging me, and I said, "All right, I'll get a website." And and when you have to pick a domain name, I I know there was other. Uh, I'll say personalities or teachers that were getting websites with their name, and I said, "Well, if I get a website. I would. Um, I want to attract people that don't know me. So, what what good would MarkBaxter.com be to someone who doesn't know what I do or who I am?" And so I came up with Voice Lesson because it's you know it was simple and direct and what I do, mm -hmm. and and it was all etched in stone back then. <laughs> we did it with chisels. 
Yeah. Uh, it's, it was just, you know, it's just one of those things where I am, I am a non-techno guy. I, I just always resist all the advancements of technology until it's screamingly obvious. I, I have probably, this is my iPhone. It's like back in the dark ages. And so <laughs> I'm just, I'm just somebody that's always resistant of that because just because I, I come from a singing background, whereas I just want the, the wits in my mind and the saliva in my mouth to be all that's necessary to move somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. So you, I didn't realize you've been teaching that long. I mean, I knew you'd been around for a while because uh, I've I've come across uh, you've got a book that's been out a long time. I think is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, I can't actually. What what's that called? Just remind me. The Rock and Roll Singers Survival Manual. Ah, okay, cool. Um, and I I'm assuming that came out. Did that come out before all this internet and stuff? As in back yeah. in the day. Eight, eighty nine. Okay. Eighty eighty eight eighty nine. Awesome. So how did you get into A, singing, and then, you know, B, coaching? Uh, Br- got into singing. Br- briefly, I guess. Yeah, just like anybody, I wanted to be in a band with my brother. I, I have an older brother, and he played guitar, so I took up drums, and uh, we had a neighbor that played bass, so the three of us were a band. I was about 13, 12, somewhere around there, real young, and nobody wanted to sing, so I started you know, singing from the drums, and uh, quickly, you know, in those days, you you gained your skills by playing at friends' houses and at school dances and things like that, and it was all uh, a very organic process, and so uh, that's how I started singing, and I stayed with it. My brother, you know, got married, moved on, and I stayed with playing drums and singing uh, through high school and through uh, a little stint I did with a bunch of different bands that were, you know, this close to signing record deals and then falling apart. The, the, the same old story everybody has. And then uh, went to college for a bit, dropped out of that because it wasn't, you know, the last thing I wanted to be was a teacher. That's all I kept saying. And so therefore I, I joined another band, started another band, made a living for about 15 years, uh, you know, in various clubs on the road playing both covers and then some originals. And I was struggling singing the whole time, just basically yelling songs as a, as a technique, if you will. And every night I would end the performance barely able to shout out the, the last song of the night. And every morning wake up with a lot of swelling and nobody in my bands at those times thought I would be able to sing the night. And so it was just a, a, a miserable cycle I was in of swelling and then starting the night starting the next night in very poor vocal condition warm up a little bit with a little bit of booze and a little bit of activity and you know by midnight I was singing okay again and then by 1:30 my voice was failing again and what really disturbed me was that I wasn't able to record or do anything of use during the day because my voice was just shot all the time and that was frustrating so I, I had had lessons in college, you know, classical voice lessons, and they just weren't applicable. I was in a rock band all the time. And so the, the, the sounds that I was being instructed I should make just weren't applicable, so I was sort of disregarding that. And then started taking, uh, I was in New Jersey at the time, and I started driving into New York and took lessons with a pretty prominent vocal coach named Katie Agresta. She was apathetic of rock singing at the time. She had a few famous clients. And she's still doing it, still a big name in the industry now. Uh, but it was it was that acknowledgement of like, yeah, you don't have to sing bel canto. You can sing with the sounds of your genre. But it was just really looking at the function of the voice, using minimal effort to create the sounds, uh, you know, getting a really efficient warm up and cool down routines. These kind of things are, are you know, were, were pivoting for me. And so from there, she uh, went on vacation. I was lessons with her for about two years, I think, solid. And she went on vacation and asked me to fill in and and sort of teach her students that week. And I really enjoyed that week. I had a I had a blast working with those singers. And that kind of gave me this this idea that I could do it. Before then, you're always thinking you're not good enough, you don't know enough, and it was just a, a trust she instilled in me that. If she trusted me, then I should trust me. And from there, I got very curious about the voice and started studying it, you know, diligently. 
and and sort of went on from there. It was a great overlap where I was still playing in bands and teaching during the day, and that was a, a really busy period in my life, and that went on for many years. And then the teaching just sort of took over because it became, you know, I, I got so busy and I, uh, my son was born, so there was a lot of life circumstances. Wow. So um, I'm interested actually because you said you you started at 12 when you were young. Um, mm-hmm. So did you go for a from that age all the way through, and you and you you kind of you didn't really manage to develop a healthy approach to it, um, or was it the, the case that the technique kind of degraded as you got into your twenties? Because um, usually people associate young singers that start young, you know, they they kind of you kind of assume they're going to kind of pick it up. Um, did you feel like that happened, or not so much with yourself? Yeah, I was just you know I was famous or infamous for for being able to scream really high. And you know, back in my day, that was extremely popular. All the songs had D's and E's, you know, in the chorus that were screamed and stuff like that. And being a young kid, I I could hit those notes. My my vocal folds were still pliable. And it was still, you know, it, it was quite easy for me to do that. What I didn't have was anything in the middle. And so as I, you know, went through puberty, finished that, you know, kept growing up, I was just. I think it was by the constant, by constantly singing. I was able to navigate my way just, you know, in a decent fashion, but I never really, you know, knuckled down and took it very seriously, uh, even many years into making a living doing it until I, until I really wanted to have some good recordings of my voice and I couldn't get any. I always felt like I was giving my best at midnight in some nightclub somewhere and I was, while on stage, always thinking, why can't I sing like this, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon? Because I'd really like to start recording and and start shopping my songs, hmm. so it was it was that desire that made me take it more seriously and sort of take assessment as to you know what I'm doing. So you would you say that you had some release in your voice, but the mid range was just you know like push 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 and then dump on the other end type thing. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That that's actually different to myself. Um, when I started uh, a little bit older than you really, uh, I was a musician when I was younger, but I was never a singer. Um, I had, I have, couldn't really have nothing above, you know, kind of um, that much above middle C in terms of it just was all push. And uh, mm-hmm. it's always interesting to me when I, I find, I, I do find some singers, they just, they just have a lot of that release just built in and they're struggling in the mid range. And it's, it's a little bit of a different prospect for them because they don't have to, they don't have to uh, figure out like how do I get my voice higher without pushing, which was so difficult for me at first. If if you've already got that from the get go, you can kind of just scoop up there and then bring it down and try and work your way in because you've got some of that freedom up there. Um, sure. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, did you have so? Did you have? I'm assuming I put here your first aha moment as a in terms of when you felt like you could actually learn and get better at this skill. Was that with the coach that you mentioned, or was there any time before that? Was there a moment where you really felt like you started to get better as a singer? I, I felt like I was getting better all the time, but it was always in such small increments, and I and I still feel that way. So I, I, I don't have any aha moment that is, for me, you know, just uh, a pivotal moment. I look at it as a, a collection. It is, it's always been, I've always been accumulating skills, and accumulating knowledge and there are you know when I look back now I, I I'm 61 years old I think I sing way better now than I did at 21 and so I I look at that as these really slow you know methodical advancements and there's a lot of there's a lot of life lessons that go into that as well they're inseparable so I was just insecure and trying really hard when I was young and and I would use overcompensation as a as a defensive mechanism and that's I think pretty common in beginning singers so as that began you know I began to trust myself and feel that I had some value as a musician as a person as you do that the overcompensation begins to reduce you gain access into more nuance little blends of you know different behaviors and like you said very well you begin to see what everybody was talking about is you know I'd read a lot of books and done a lot of things you know with with uh, also uh, Eugene Rabine was a was a very influential teacher for me I, I studied with him after Katie and uh, he's in Argentina now but he had the same approach uh, classical in nature but 
uh, very sort of universal in terms of functionality. And so I was turned on by all this information, but I just didn't feel like I could apply it yet. And I just think it takes you know some living to to meld the two together. Yeah, I tell you that um, that really really resonates with me a lot because I've I've felt that in order to become good at this, I've had to open open up as a person and uh, mm-hmm. become yeah. You know, when I was younger, I had relatively low confidence, and um, all of that gets in the way of of just uh, expressing yourself, which is a lot of what singing is going to be about. Um, and you can feel it like a vice when it's there. And when you, as you go through the journey, and you 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 op- and you, you open up emotionally and technically in your ability. Um, you know, I think back now, and I I, I want to reach out and help that guy almost because it's like you know you just it's 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 sad really because people you don't realize at the time how how closed off you are in that sense right. and and you you see it in other people and I feel like those singers are actually generally speaking in the minority singers like myself uh, with uh, most singers I find when I go to open mics and I perform in London um, are relatively calm and comfortable in their own skin. Um, so I always find it interesting when I'm when I come across singers who are very scared and closed because I see a lot of myself in that, and um, and I I do I empathise with it because it's it's a horrible cycle to, to build your way out of and try and figure your way out of because it's at that point it goes beyond just learning the technique I guess is what you'd say and you know you go to YouTube and you look for singing tips and they don't go they just don't go that deep into some of these things and it does if you've got those types of problems you have to go deep into some of these things because it's the only way out and it's uncomfortable for people um but uh, that's a great great thing you've shared there don't you think that's the attraction that you and i had to music was this as a vehicle for getting out of our own way i think there's a survival instinct built in there and, and i know as a very young child i was very attracted to music and and didn't know why, but just felt like it was speaking to me in a in a in a different way than just I want to be famous or I want to be the cool kid to be able to play drums. It 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 was to me it was never about you know meeting women or or being the cool guy. It was it was always something a little deeper, and I couldn't articulate it when I was young. It just felt like a healthy thing to pursue, even though I was getting a lot of resistance from my parents about you know that track in life. They're, they told me over and over again I was throwing my life away by dedicating it to music, but it just felt like the right thing for me to do. And I'm sure there are other paths that I could have taken that would have been so equally as uh, uh, as emotionally fulfilling, but I, I don't know what they would have been. Um, so I'm forever grateful that, uh, you know, it's a cliche, but I feel like music saved my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, I felt often like, the things I can express through my music, uh, I've got a lot of energy that I want to get out. That there's not really, it, in my mind, it's either I channel that into something positive, or you can channel it into some things that are negative. Really, you know, you people who are probably off center in terms of their personality, you know, you, you you're more likely to end up in trouble in life. Is is how mm-hmm. it is, and. If someone can channel that into something good that's going to be productive for them in their life, then um, that is a, such a, a great thing for somebody. And I, I, I felt like that. I often wonder, you know, if I hadn't found this, what would I be doing? And uh, I can't think that it would have been a. It, it definitely would have been worse, and I would have been in probably in more trouble. I think for yourself, it probably back then. Uh, I'm lucky that I have a, a mum who was very uh, generally supportive of what I was doing. Um, I think the further back you go, it's probably m- more more difficult, you know, uh, in terms of social acceptability, and you know, I want to be an artist or whatever, um, was less probably less acceptable back back when you were younger. Um, so and I can imagine that being difficult. Parenting was very different back then as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a diff- different generation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I one thing I've. Uh, uh, I liked uh, what I watched. I watched one of your videos that I watched ages ago, but I it, I liked it at the time. Was this uh, one you got when you're talking about how old and ancient the voice is, and um, and uh, how 
you know, people have been doing this, not necessarily in an organized musical way, but people have been using their voices for, you know, reasons of survival, you know, hunting and things like this, for, for really since the dawn of man. And um, I love this, generally I love this idea because I feel like there's something, um, there's something profound about it in the sense of, I feel like the voice is so attached to our history and 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 what it is to be human on a really profound kind of level, a more a more basic level than you know politics and things like that, which is more on the surface. I'd say um, I found I've got to know myself and a lot of my nature as a human through singing, uh, just because I, I I genuinely feel like it it kind of it feeds me towards some of those things that I was born with, innate qualities in my personality that are kind of maybe hard to articulate sometimes, but it's this sense of just the way I was born and the voice I have and those two things coming together in an interesting way with, with music and stuff like that. Um, I guess I'm kind of just elaborating there on this idea, but I go, you know, well, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? The thoughts are that I'm I'm in the camp that says singing and like you said not I don't mean entertainment when I say singing, uh, singing came before uh, language, that prosody uh, is the is the musical sound to a voice. Hey man, how you doing? It's like all that up and down undulation, the rhythmical patterns. Our brains are hardwired to to dissect the musicality of a voice. So it's often not what we say; it's how we say something that elicits the response and then then the person will go back and get the gist of what we said but it's always first the way we say something creates an emotional reaction and that's if you if you will you know sort of be like an archaeologist into the brain you'll see where the layers of the brain are dedicated towards dissecting the incoming sounds and so before civilization before written language you know before language itself there were sounds that would indicate uh, danger. There were sounds that would indicate bliss. There were sounds that indicate horny, hungry, lonely, you know, good berry, ugh, bad berry. Ugh. Just all those different grunts and groans have a, a musicality to them. And if you elongate that, that would be, you know, very primal version of what we call what the ancients did when they chanted. What What all of this sort of leads to is the is that phonating is a is a very uh, is a very animal way to to express an emotional state. So a lion's roar or you know the, the howl of a wolf. These are emotional states. These are territorial warnings. These are communications. And so we we have a hierarchy here. We like to think of ourselves as top of the food chain, but you know our innate qualities we share with with any other animal that makes a sound and so I find that that tapping into that it just made me curious many years ago as to why is it hard why do we get such resistance the vice you describe that clamp you're feeling when you're trying to sing something or express something why would that happen to us why is it difficult and so if you keep tracing that back it, it becomes this divide between civilization and survival, the divide between classes, the divide between language. And so now that we are so language-based, there, there has to be a word to represent a feeling, otherwise we don't codify that feeling. So there are cultures that don't have a separate word for music or dance. They view them as the very same thing. Now in my culture and in your culture, they're very separate things. So we can be a musician, but you can't dance. Or you can be a dancer, and I can't play any music. I'm not musical. And that's only because we have such a definitive language now that puts things in smaller and smaller boxes. So we begin to identify ourselves as young children based on the culture of our household, and then the culture of our neighborhood, and then keep going outside those circles. And it is, uh, it's imprinted us before we realize we're a person. And so that's there's the code that the brain is going to operate on to survive you got to get along in your culture and so in the household where we all grew up in had a very great effect on the way we use our voice and and that's what I find I am trying to undo both in myself and in anyone I work with 
you have to play kind of a detective and ask 20 questions as to, you know, who do they speak like, their mother or their father, or, or, or neither of them? Uh, are they one of many siblings? Are they an only? Was it a loud household? Was it a very quiet, civilized household? All those things are going to imprint our behavior, and it's invisible to us, absolutely invisible. And so I, I hearken back to that ancient, you know, origin just to let everybody know that I work with that you're worthy of pursuing this. This is something that we all share. And there's, uh, you know, there are very primal sounds, but I go beyond that and say this is innate. So I find that the word primal is a little bit derivative in that I, I still have a chip on my shoulder from all the classical information I had to weave through back in the 70s when it was always called healthy or legitimate or good technique and and everything I wanted to do was bad technique, unhealthy, illegitimate. And so language gets very dicey when it gets stuck in there and, and if you don't recognize it as just that, it's just a word, it becomes a command and we don't realize that we're under those commands. So you gotta get in there with tweezers and start to dissect the language of your thoughts and that will release your muscles. Yeah, because really people aren't going to be really consciously aware of of that stuff until they're probably in their late teens early 20s um i remember not realizing any of this really until i started singing and dealing with some of the problems and thinking back and but you're not even self-aware until you're kind of seven eight that's already eight years of influence and and um like you say depending on the type of environment you're in it's going to inhibit some of those those uh free expressive qualities that are innate you know you're you're born expressing yourself as a baby um and i think a lot of it is how much those uh, how much social pressure has been put on in inhibiting those you know those that that free aggressive expression um and uh What's interesting is that that type of expression within singing is is acceptable. What what I found is in some environments a certain type of expression, you know, loud noises, this type of thing, is acceptable within singing. It is, but then, like we say, in the home or you know at work or in those social scenarios, the, the types of expression you're going to use freely in singing are not not people are you know that's just not what you do so um that distinction is kind of important i think very important i think you're onto it as i always tell people we give we applaud people that act like two-year-olds on stage <laughs> and, and we arrest them when they do so off stage so we put them on a pedestal we give them millions of dollars for acting like a two-year-old but only on command only on stage and so there's such a double standard, there's such, you know, such a hypocritical nature to our culture that we reward such free spirit, but only in contained environments. Yeah, it's, it's, it, sport is a bit like that as well. I think about boxing, for example. You know, yeah, exactly. if it's sanctioned, if it's in a ring, you know, these people are paid good money and they become very successful at what they do and they are lauded as heroes. But, you know, if you're outside a pub on a Saturday night, you do the same thing. Um, exactly. You're going to be arrested, or you know, you could uh, get in some trouble. Um, it's interesting this because it's just you know you start you you start thinking about you know what why is that and uh, there are there are reasons for this, but um, I do think yeah, that the best singers often are just the most comfortable in expressing themselves, and they just let rip, um, and there's no no fear the there. Singers, the best singers are crazy, <laughs> and, and I mean that in the most you know endearing way. As there is a chemistry in us, and obviously there is a, a, a stoplight, a cultural traffic cop, if you will, and it, and it understands the rules of the culture, and it stops us from acting like a fool, if you will. And those singers that we so revere are usually the ones that break all those cultural codes and, and seem to not have any resistance whatsoever. So. We, we're really captivated by the way they express themselves. Um, but then, you know, after their career or during it, there's always this documentary or expose about how difficult they are to live with, how incredibly, you know, sensitive they are or how addictive they are. And you go down the list and we are all guilty of 
having a double set of standards where we applaud their behavior, like I said, on stage, but then, you know, if they go through several marriages or if they, uh, you know, have a, a drug issue or alcohol issue, we never connect those two as to, oh, that's why they're such a free spirit. It's mm. like, they have no rules in their life. It's always leap first, look second. And that makes for wonderful singing, especially in contemporary music. But it, it, it also makes for a lousy roommate or a terrible spouse or, or, you know, or a, you know, put it this way. Some of the singers, you know, that I know, if they weren't successful, they would be in jail. Yeah, I can completely understand that. And I think when you open up and push push the boundaries in that sense, it, it, I do think it kind of has to be a little bit in your nature because uh, at least with certain types of singing, you, you get a sense of it. Some singers are very conservative and they sing very, very well, um, mm -hmm. but they sing safely, you know, and then you get other styles and other singers who do not sing safely at all. Now, and I say safely, not in a physical way necessarily. I just mean safely in, in terms of the, the amount of, uh, the amount of, emotional stretch involved as in you know they are they're they're pushing what they're physically going to be able to do to to the limit um it's how and, uh, vulnerable they are it's mm -hmm. they're very vulnerable and mm -hmm. it's usually for that reason that intimate they're so intimate and they're so vulnerable they're so exposed when they sing and that's very welcome on stage but it's very hard to deal with off stage to be constantly in a state of vulnerability or in threat and so so drugs seem very appealing uh, you know, moods are very, uh, you know, there's a lot of bipolar, there's a lot of schizotypal is, a, is another psychological state that's very common in creative cultures. And so it's a, it is just that level of exposure of being vulnerable. Actors also are, are very much willing to go there, kind of turn off the cultural confines that keep us feeling like we're civil and there's order in our life. You have to turn that off to become another person. And so when actors do a really good job, we forget they're acting. And <laughs> when singers do a really good job, we forget they're singing and we're simply moved by their presence. Yeah. Um, in regards to, I, I put at the end of this, um, what does inhibition feel like and how does a singer distinguish between the right kind of tension and the, the kind of negative inhibition type of tension that we're talking about? Um, I, I found this to be a, a tricky thing, especially towards the beginning because I had a lot of tension, so I let go of it all, or tried to, but then I realized uh, eventually that I wasn't gonna really be able to sing high with no tension like that. I had to kind of, I had to grip onto something. Um, do you have any kind of, any thoughts on that, or any kind of guidance you give people in terms of, you know, how do I let go of this without, you know, without letting go of absolutely everything? Was that, I don't. I feel many of us don't have a target when we go to sing, and so the sound that we look to produce or the expression that we look to connect with uh, will dictate the behavior. And I always say, you, you, what pitch, what vowel or timbre, like what tone of voice, what volume, and what rhythm. Those are the four aspects of sound and of singing, and that's all there is: pitch, timbre, volume, and rhythm or time, put those aspects as targets and now ask for that, whatever sound you wanna make in the minimal amount of effort possible. Some sounds don't require much effort, some require a lot of effort. And to me, when, when we have real objective targets at play, we can then talk about minimizing tension because then you can hear the pitch went a little flat or the sound lacks brilliance. And so say, all right, we took away too much. We need to, you know, put another log on the fire there. But I but when it's just the feeling, when it's just placement of a vibration, I often ask singers like, what do you what do you where are we going with this? If we just make a sound, that's like a vocal doodle. And it could be good or not good, but it's you know, to me singing is expressing an emotional state. Vocalizing is working on the instrument where we can be objective about the mechanics and about our behavior. But that's, there's no emotional expression there. So it's just a sound. And we have to call the sound before we produce it to know if we're being efficient or not. And I just find that gets very cloudy for a lot of singers where they'll switch, uh, you know, organically. They'll have something they want to say and they'll hear themselves not sounding 
as intended as they wanted to, so they'll flip back into coaching themselves. More this, more that, you know, relax my neck. And I know I did that routinely on stage. If I'm singing and I like the way I sound, I'm fine. I'm in the zone. And as soon as I hear a flat note come out of me or something, I start talking to myself. And now oh. I've I've bailed out of the song now. I'm I'm singing the lyrics, but my mind is elsewhere. And so I I often would get that comment from people. I knew when I was too caught up in my mechanics, if I would come off the stage and someone say, you have a really good voice. Because I always feel where the singer's attention is, that's where the listener's attention will be directed. And so if I'm thinking about my mechanics and my breathing, I'm unconsciously sort of directing others to do the same thing about my singing. And when I'm letting the lyrics move me, I'm sort of directing everyone to do the same thing, those that are listening to me. And so when I would come off stage and somebody would say, man, when you sang that song, I started thinking about my mother or my girlfriend or what have you. It's like, then I know I just went another layer higher. That, that I, I don't know of any songs written that are about singing, meaning, you know, the mechanics, the anatomy, the physiology. And yet that's where a lot of singers' minds will go because we're insecure about releasing a sound that will, well, it's going to be judged. And so we want to make sure it is the right pitch and the right tone and the right this and the right that. And that, that to me, we should be governed by a lyric or by a, an emotional expression. And that's a leap of faith that I didn't have when I started. And I find that that's where all the training comes in, is just giving me and everyone else permission to let go of, those, uh, of that second guessing, of the doubt and of the inhibition, trusting the innate reflexes that we're all born with and allowing that expression that you intend to come through, almost to sing you, if you will. Hmm. Yeah, you, uh, you explain this stuff well, and um, I'm actually quite impressed, because uh, I often talk about some of this stuff, and I feel like, um, uh, I feel like, I feel like you're explaining it very well, and um, I don't have to often say that to people, um, which is really awesome. Um, I've been alive a long time. Carl. Yeah, I get that impression. I mean, I don't say that. I just, I genuinely say that in a kind of, um, just it's a, a deep way that you're explaining it. It's, it's not just on the surface. And I found in my own singing, I used to self-talk a lot, and as I've got more proficient at the skills, that's obviously dwindled away, and um, now I'm more able to be open as a singer. But it's this real confusing confusing area for people I think where um, if they let go too much it's more likely to go wrong and so they want to go back to you know consciously consciously thinking about it a little bit and I think there's a time and place but I think you're completely right ultimately you've got to get to a point where you do not think about the mechanics anymore and you just let go um, and that's obviously where great singing lies because that's when the emotional tent is directing people t towards the emotions and what what and I, I completely I, I, I spoke about this with um, with a girl who lives upstairs called Nicola so uh, numerous times this sense of of on when you're on stage really emotionally you're leading the audience and or with your thoughts if those thoughts are directed towards you know doubt self-consciousness what are people thinking all this stuff that is what people are going di to be directed towards so you're literally you you've got to point people in the right direction that's really your job i feel like as a singer is to allow people to go in in the emotional direction and um be comfortable being there and um, you know, going back to what we were saying a little while ago, that is not doesn't necessarily feel natural for struggling singers. They want to be more in control, and they want to, to feel safe. Um, mm -hmm. And great singing is in that horrible middle ground for a lot of people, where there's a degree of control, but there's also this sense of being vulnerable and emotionally open in front of strangers, which most of us are not used to. Um, unless we've spent our you know a lot of our childhood on hood on stage doing this type of thing and it was normalized then before we had the chance to to to, to start trying to control everything um, um awesome um so in terms of do well, what you, you just explained let's just recap that because i think it's profound it, it just in that uh, a 13 year old you know a precocious 13 year old doesn't need uh, lessons per se they've got permission within themselves to express 
whatever environment they grew up within allowed them this. And to me, when I get a 13 year old as a student, if they're a professional, you know, and they're losing their voice or whatever, I know they're just you know, overcompensating. So I'm not going to give them much, uh, much rules, if you will. But then again, if you get a shy, you know, 20 year old, they will need step by step, do this, place your jaw down, feel the sound here. And this is paint by numbers, if you will. But what it does is it just gives it sort of like puts out the crumbs to let Hansel and Gretel come find themselves. And I and that's what I had to go through. And that's what, you know, most people that are introverted have to go through before they feel safe enough, as you say, to let their feelings be known. So it is on the foundation of skill that I don't need to think about skill when I sing. It took a lot of years to get there. And so, so I and you and anybody that's coaching tends to make skill set the, you know, the paramount thing. It's like when they come in, we're just drilling scales and do this and do that. But I'm, I'm very quick to tell people, it's like, as soon as you can, let's jump out of this ship and let's go into the water. It's like right now we're, we're safe in the boat, but really no one's going to want to hear us sing scales. People want to know who you are. And if you're not ready to unveil that yet, I get it. But whenever you are, I'll dive in that water with you and, and we'll know. We'll be within distance of that, that boat. So we could always swim back if we feel a little threatened, if there's a shark <laughs> coming in the water. <laughs> but so the, the point is there is this spectrum of, of permission and spectrum of, of courage. And so to me, the most moving singers are courageous uh, more than they are confident. Because confidence means you're assured of a result. And I would rather hear a singer be a little more at risk, not physically, but at risk emotionally, at risk musically. And so they're being courageous with their voice right then. And as you know, that's a spiral. They're leading the audience. They're leading all of us to do the same. And so as go the singer's psyche, so goes the audience. And so as we, as we you know, become more and more courageous and more sort of like assured in our movements, I find that we're going to keep looking for more and more if, we're, if the artist in us is pure. And if, if all we want to do is hit a high C, those people tend to plateau and feel less and less rewarded by it because the note itself isn't really the reward for the audience or for the singer. Yeah, I, I think the, the reward really is that feeling that you are fitting in almost. I, I feel like that. If I feel like I'm expressing myself openly and people are enjoying it, it's almost this sense of, oh, okay, I can be myself. <laughs> exactly. You know, so when I was younger, I was not a good singer. Uh, and yet I was professing that I was going to be a world famous rock star. So my father was saying, you're crazy. We don't have it in our DNA to be, you're not Pavarotti, you're, not, you know, you're delusional. And what he didn't understand was I simply liked the way I feel on stage. I liked who I was on stage. And it was where I felt I could be the most honest. It's when I felt that I could be vulnerable but yet safe because I'm on stage. And so I know that's the opposite of mo most people that would feel threatened on stage. But I, I, because I started at such a young age, as you pointed out, I didn't know any better when I first started performing that it was something that most people fear. So it, it became my home base. And it was, it was in, my, you know, in my real world that I felt out of touch and vulnerable and frightened and introverted. So I, I really like who I am on stage more than I like who I am off stage. And that was my attraction and therefore wanted to get better in order to be legitimately on stage more. Because it was one thing to like how you feel, but it's another thing if other people like what you're doing on there too. That helps. Yeah. Um, I found nowadays uh, that I, I like the person that I, I feel like I am when I can get there. And uh, on stage, I mean, and I almost wonder, you know, why was I so reluctant to be to open up? You know, why? Why was it so scary? Um, and uh, I know the answers, but uh, the, the the long the long steps to get to a solution, I almost almost I feel like they, in a sense, I find it difficult to relate to because I think how can it be that difficult just to 
just to open up and, and be your, your truest self. There's certainly things you can express about yourself on stage that you know you just you're not going to generally going to generally be doing day to day in your life. Um, you know, in the, like we were saying earlier, in the supermarket or at work. Um, and so I, I, I do think the best singers are most at home on stage and they're less comfortable almost off stage and obviously vice versa for struggling singers. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Let's, um, uh, what have I got here? I wanted to, uh, how much time have you got left on it? You might need to, I, I, I kind of want to wrap this up relatively soon. So we've got a nice hour, I think we're about 40 minutes. So um, we'll do like maybe another 15 minutes or so if we can... Uh, um, I yeah, I've I've kind of been debating this in my mind just because, um, and I know there's a lot of. Uh, so I've put here sensations when we sing. What type of sensations can singers latch onto when they learn to sing? How does a singer know decide what the right sensations are from the wrong ones? That kind of goes back to the tension and versus the right kind of tension thing. But I wanted to um, talk about this idea of. Um, uh, I watched a video of yours where you talked about that there's no, you know, you can't physically feel the vocal cords, and um, and I was thinking based on my my experience and how I've learnt this, um, what am I latching onto when I sing physically? Um, and uh, I I actually put a comment ages ago on that video because um, I I kind of wanted to get a, some feedback from you in in terms of my thoughts. Um, the, the type of feeling I feel like I latch onto when I sing isn't necessarily, you know, this touching sense. It's I feel like it's the same type of sensation I feel when I lift lift something heavy and I feel the muscle engage, but then mm. I, but then I don't really, you know, set in terms of sensing I can sense that muscle engaging, but obviously you don't feel it in the same sense. Of, of, of touching does that make sense yeah, and I, I just yeah and I just wanted to kind of ask you about that it, it does that fit in with with your understanding because in my mind really that's all I'm latching on to just uh, purely from a mechanical sense you know technique stuff is I feel like I, I'm latching on to the to, to the, the the coordination of the muscles in there obviously small muscles and feeling them kind of flex and 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 grit just like my hand would if I was shaking your hand or something like that. Um, so it's the difference between tactile sense and proprioception, which is the, the general gist of your brain. Uh, you and I are both sitting, so our brains are aware that our butts are on a chair. We can feel our body weight in that. And so that's a, that's a, and I know where my feet are right now. I don't need to look at them. Uh, I can sense where my my body is in in space, so to speak, and so there are uh, uh, pressure sensors in the folds that are really really sensitive, and there are you know mobility or motor units in there. There's uh, the wiring of the larynx to me is fascinating. In let's say our thigh, the muscle to nerve fiber is one to a hundred. So that means for every hundred muscle fibers, there's one nerve fiber. And that's because we have crude motion with our leg. You lift it up and down, swing it this way, that way. It's not a lot of fine finesse. With the larynx, there is a one to one. So that's one nerve fiber to every one muscle fiber. So that level of nuance, that the nerve trunk leading to the larynx is more dense than that going to the eye. So it's incredibly nuanced. And, and all of that is autonomic. So that, just like the eye, how do you know if you, how do you know you're tensing your oscillatory muscles in your eye? How do you know your pupil is dilated to the proper amount? Watching me on your screen right now. Yeah, I would say that is completely unconscious. So the point is you have an intention to see me. And so if you look past your computer screen, your eye will have to focus. That requires muscle effort to do so. And if you looked around your room, the, the muscles of the eye are the fastest in the body. Mm. And nobody ever questions them unless it's an unintentional event. So you'll find out as you get older, you know, I'm like any old person, I need reader glasses because my eyes now have changed shape, right? So that means those muscles are tiring. So I knew as I was holding a, a book further and further away from me, I was like, something is wrong with my eyes because the intention to read like I normally was not being met. 
So to answer your question, I make sure that singers have an intention first. And often, like I say, they don't, other than just good or decent. <laughs> and those aren't good intentions. Those are ambiguous to the, to the motor cortex. And so it's a cultural thing to say you're, you're, you have a good voice or a decent voice, but it's not a directive for coordination. So what I ask them is, what pitch are we going for? What volume, what, you know, what timbre, what rhythm? Once those are defined, once you know what you want to look at, is squeezing your eye okay? Depends. Depends if you can see what you're looking for. And so I don't have a requirement or I don't suggest sensations that people can feel because that, that proprioception is so subjective. And that was the trouble I had in college when my professor was trying to make me feel like the tone was pointing out of the center of my head and I completely understand what he was intending now, but I didn't then, it was like, I have stuff here, I can't shoot the pitch out of my head. And I was, you know, I was taking it literally and he meant it figuratively. So mm -hmm. the, the point is to get the intended sound for your eye to hone in on what you intend to see that is a directive that is really clear for the muscles and for coordination. And without it, there's so much guesswork that can go on. It's what makes us paranoid and mm. what feeds the fear about singing. So I bring everybody back to that directive. Like, what are we trying to do here? What sound are we gonna make? And when we get lost, then I'll simply ask for a different sound, something that's more definable. Do something absurd, just so we know, okay, I thought that sound and I made it come out of my mouth. And so you can observe where you felt it and stuff like that. But if you, even if you recall that feeling, it's not going to guarantee you get that exact sound again, because the room acoustics and your condition inside, what time of day it is, how hydrated you are. There's so many other factors there, but nothing is stopping me from replicating that sound day after day if I simply ask for that sound rather than the behavior I think it's going to be required to get it. Yeah, I see what you mean. So you're kind of saying that. Um, in the same way that we we ask our eye to focus on something, um, we do that all in in terms of audio. We ask the voice to produce X sound, and and then we the 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 we have to kind of estimate the coordination to to, to get to get there. I guess you'd say and uh, do, see what do happens. You estimate, do you estimate with your eyes? No, not with my eyes. Um, I don't think we need to with our voice either, Carl. Yeah. I think inhibition will will stall the process, will clog the flow, and so so when I'm thinking a pitch, he and I come up under it, I know that's not my larynx's fault. I know that I put a little filter in the way of that. Oh, I messed that up last night, or this or that. I can have a million little chatters in my head that will sabotage that very easy flow, and it's no different than what a magician does with sleight of hand, and we think we saw magic. Right, but all he did was draw our attention one place and do the magic somewhere else, and we're fooled because we think our eyes are infallible. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think that kind of definitely gives a lot more uh, context to to that to the, the the this this idea of what should we be feeling. I feel like in my mind, I am. I almost feel like that there's some conscious control and unconscious control, almost like I'm in the middle ground versus when I think about when I focus on something, I feel like there's zero conscious control of it. And so I'm kind of interested in, because I guess when I breathe, for example, when I breathe, I, can, I breathe without thinking, but then I can also consciously adjust my breathing. Um, it goes where, to with the eye though. When you say not consciously focusing your eye, you're choosing to look at something. Yeah, I guess actually because I can choose to to actually look at my hand, but but focus far far away, and then it's all blurry my hand. Even though so, I like doing this with people, if you wiggle the near finger and sing a low note, and then wiggle the far finger and sing a high note, e what did you feel in your eye? Uh, nothing. <laughs> I agree. And yeah. so I didn't feel anything in my voice either when I sang those two notes. 
And so the point being, comfort is the word I just come up with a lot. I think singers should be comfortable because if you're doing something uncomfortable, it's not sustainable. And that is a very sliding scale for people. Some people have a very low threshold for comfort or, and or you know discomfort, and some have a very high threshold, and that's very personal. Mm. So, so the point being that I don't feel what I did to make those pitches change because I'm not insecure about singing in front of you. But if somebody said, sing this note to this note, and you know, I don't know, I don't know, if it was Stevie Wonder that asked me to sing something, I think I'd be a little intimidated to sing in front of Stevie Wonder because I happen to really enjoy his singing. So I know I would, I would want to do well, and that, that extra little filter that I'd put on there would give me just a little more muscle behavior in there than necessary. And often, the problem is if we're successful then, if I sing the note well with that extra tension, my brain's going to go, aha, that's necessary to sing that note. And unfortunately, that will be baggage I carry with me for a long time. Yeah, that's actually, uh, I, I, I get what you're saying there. And um, I'm, I definitely think that it's so, it can be very subtle, these, this type of thing that you can add without realizing. And I, if I think back to how I used to be, my threshold for that, that panic and that fear setting in was generally speaking probably a lot lower than average. Whereas nowadays it's probably more so towards the other end. And, um, and but I still have to consciously get myself into the flow of being that way. And I, I've, I see other singers who I'm big, a big fan of who have always sung freely and they, they don't really need to, to kind of get into the flow so much because that's just all they know. So they really? just, they just yeah. go and they, they don't need no warm up and they just go. And um, I, I, I need less, less, less and less time as, 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 as the years go by, but that is a difference I definitely see. I see um, people that have sung freely, um, and that's all they know is they don't have to to kind of get in the in the momentum or the motion of of singing in that open way. Um, and uh, whereas somebody that's struggled and then come more into that, I feel like I find I have to kind of play some tricks in my mind sometimes to to get myself from not getting in my head and avoid that 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 stuff coming in you know the the fear the the anticipation the 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 abstract thinking you know what are people what you know is this good do people like me this type of thing all that stuff i have to work to to keep at bay generally the neurology of what you're talking about is gamma ambituric acid that's a neurotransmitter that's emitted when we that's the hesitant there's the stoplight in us and so those singers you're talking about aren't they're not bathed in that that neurotransmitter is not secreted when they sing. And that's what I call permission. So they have a flow. The direct connect from their inspiration to phonation is microseconds. And so there's zero inhibition, there's zero interference, let's call it. And quite typically, a, a normal person will have a little bit of hesitation. Do I really wanna sing this? How's it gonna come out? That split second we have that thought releases that neurotransmitter which puts a inhibition, and then ironically, what they call it in neurology is a disinhibition. So we have to literally turn off the inhibition in order to get the green light to come on. So it's a little bit convoluted, and that's why that's, I'm a beginner guitar player, and that's why I have to talk to my hand to tell it to make certain chords. And I obviously know plenty of guitar players that just flows. This, the music just flows from their fingers. And that's what you're describing when we have a thought to sing and it just flows. Ah, it just comes out. And as an observer of that person, you sense the flow in which they sing with. And that's captivating. It's, it's really, it puts us in a trance. Just like watching a great athlete, just like watching anybody that's in that flow. We call it the zone, but it's just a, a literally a nonstop flow from brain. You know, those neurons operate at lightning speed. And so the normal little stop gaps that we put up are to stop us from jumping off of things that we shouldn't jump off of. In other words, normal inhibition is, is what got us to survive through the millennia. 
So it's a it's a good survival based thing that we have these. Mm, I don't know if this is good to eat this. That little hesitation saved a lot of lives. It just doesn't make for good singing. <laughs> yeah, and it's. Um... I, I often talk about analogies between learning guitar and singing and try and draw comparisons and um, so I like what you said there. I, I I found it's certainly possible to to improve this tendency and uh, as your skills get better you're much more likely to be able to switch it off but yep. if I look back the, the, the hardest conundrum really for, for I think struggling singers typically to solve is, is some of this stuff because it can be so debilitating and paralyzing for, for a learning singer, especially if they have high expectations about what they want to achieve. Um, it can um, be a very difficult time, just generally, because yeah. you are in a vice. You feel like you're in a vice, and how do you get out of it? Um, and then you see a lot of other singers who you look up to, and there's no fear. <laughs> and they have that open channel between themselves and the listener. And that's the thing, when that stuff gets there, really all it is is it's just putting walls up in between in between yourself and the listener and then the, the connection breaks down. And that's when you kind of, you know, you watch a singer and you get bored and you're like, what's next? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. exactly. And you never feel that way when somebody is emotionally open. Even if technically they're not the best singers, as in they don't sing necessarily very high, um, they don't sing, you know, with anything particularly special. I'm a big fan of a, a guy called David who I who really was my first love in terms of singers. And um, uh, he used to sing high and he used to you know, do loads of cool stuff. And I, um, I went to watch a show he did uh, a few years after I met him. And um, I don't know if it was on off day or what, but he, he sang every, everything in chest voice. And um, no, nothing high. And, um, and I remember really profoundly realizing that that even singing, um, you know, um, artistically unadventurous, you know, just within narrow range and things like that, even then he was captivating. Even then he was very, very interesting to listen to. Just like a lot of well-known country singers, you know, they don't necessarily be the most adventurous singers, but there's something about the what they're doing where you feel this this natural connection where there's no nothing in the way. I think mm -hmm. to me that is really the the, the 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 clear distinction between someone who's got a shot as a professional singer and someone who's just never going to connect in that way is 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 that channel open um, and that obviously goes back to what we were saying and I I talk about this a lot at the minute because I really want to get across to people that that this is in many ways much more important in terms of success as a singer and, and in terms of earning money than you know singing really really high now that can be great and obviously we all, we all want to develop the, the technique and stuff but it, you know all of the singers that earn a living are open comfortable and there isn't this this wall in the way of what they're doing um, whereas there's hardly you know it's hard to find singers who sing very high but have a lot of junk in the way that earn a living doing it those singers are, you know, they might end up wedding singers or whatever, but they're not. They're not going to sell millions of records, basically. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, I say that just because there, frankly, aren't, aren't any, or there's not very many of them now. Mm, in the past, probably more so, but nowadays, you know, you watch all of the acoustic, the up and coming young acoustic singers and all this stuff. All of them are free and open and calm. Um, it's good. It's good reason to listen to somebody. I agree with you. <laughs> Awesome, man. Um, do you have anything you want to just close up with, Mark? This has been a pleasure, by the way. And um, uh, yeah, it actually has been much more, more interesting than I anticipated. So thank you so much. Do you have any... Um, do you know? <laughs> no, I, I guess um, I, I knew that it would be interesting, but um, it's just been based on your videos, which I've watched quite a few of over the years. Um, I felt I got a lot more just... I think people will get more out of this discussion in terms of understanding some of the details of, of what you think and stuff than than some of the more focused videos you know on one topic or this topic or that topic um yeah um obviously we'll put up your your details website and youtube channel but do you have anything that you want to finish up with in terms of closing thoughts or just just basically that it is innate to sing and i use myself as the example i i put up every roadblock i put up every wall that 
that one could imagine and still manage to jump over those, to barrel through them, to melt them. So it is the grit and courage and love, uh, passion uh, for, for it, that's the bigger driving source. All the other stuff is detail and, <laughs> and the details can be filled in if you have the passion and they're, they're ancillary if you don't. It really doesn't matter if you don't have the passion. So I, I can't teach love you can't teach passion. You can't teach courage, and so it's just I like to I like to inspire people to find that within them, and then like I said, the rest is just details of connecting X, Y, and Z to get to a, a destination. So if if I can do it, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. I did start with the best of circumstances, and uh, and I feel like I, like I said I I enjoy myself when I sing now, and I didn't in the past. Yeah. That's a great way to finish up, and I think you are. It's it's such a good thing to understand some of the deeper motivations that that go behind singing, because I I think that you said this earlier. You know, you know, if you just want to sing high C, it's not going to take you through the journey. There's got to be something deeper that's pushing you forward, and some of these some of these deeper concepts about what it is to be human and what it is to express yourself openly and the importance of that, these types of things are going to give somebody a deeper motivation that's really going to push them through the, the difficult times that all singers have and um, you know, struggling singers have more so, especially at the start. You've yep. got to find that spark and you can't, you can give people this kind of information but ultimately like that that ability to that passion to go through it and go through the journey and the bravery to do that is um is is something that can be hard to come by sometimes um fair yeah it's it's okay to suck <laughs> yeah that's a, a great thing um i always feel like that you know it's uh, as i got it better i'm like i care less about how good i sound ironically right. <laughs> it is yeah. yeah and um and that lack of worrying allows you to sing better it's all just it all just is such a I go on about this loads these self reinforcing loops that we have either yeah. in a positive or negative direction and it's um it's it's another thing um but yeah that's a great way to finish man I really appreciate this um thank you so much and maybe we'll uh, catch up again in you know six months or a year or something and see where we're at but um this has been awesome good luck to you it's been a pleasure <laughs> thanks so much ma'am